also take you a little bit to Italy, but I will come back to the Levant. Uh, so that uh, I try to link these things. Um, now, uh, I also come back to, to Medina Tabu. I don't need to say much about it because we have referred to it pretty much. Uh, the thing that I am starting with is the question, um, if we want to talk about the sea peoples, who are these sea peoples, when do we have them, and where are they active, and where are they coming from? We have the uh, eighth ring, uh, ring year of Ramesses the uh, third inscription on top, and the uh, mentioning of the sea people uh, Ethnica of the fifth year of Meneptah uh, below. And uh, one of the, the, the basic facts uh, is that, that we cannot locate these Ethnica uh, along, around the Mediterranean by, by referring exclusively to second millennium uh, uh, written sources, except for the Luca and perhaps the Akaya Washa, if uh, one agrees, and I'm not a philologist, I will not judge that, if this is possible to equate with the Akiawa, uh, um, and then the, the the, the only other thing could be the, um, the Danuna, which was also discussed. But it's not really clear. But, and then we have many names which are not identifiable, and which are obviously beyond the knowledge of, of the Egyptians, and so also of the Ugaritans, if we think of the Shikalayu, uh, and then the Hittite king who wants to, to, wants to interview the person who was uh, uh, captive of the Shikalayu, because he wants to know who these people are who live on ships. So we don't know where they are from. We know their material culture through the depictions of the Egyptians, uh, unfortunately um, only at the very beginning and at the, at the end of their um, activities, Ramses III, here's the sea battle, and Ramses <coughs> II, who is in fact the first uh, one to depict um, these sea peoples in, in reliefs, and it's the Shardana. We also have heard about them uh, on the Battle of Kadesh. Uh, we have them below here as uh, the guard of the pharaoh, and they have quite distinctive uh, weaponry which the, uh, uh, sets them apart from the Egyptian soldiers. Now, if we want to talk about or to trace these people, we can go by their uh, attire, and this has, of course, been done. And one of these uh, already in the research, and one of the, the, the uh, very um, uh, primary things to look for was the horn helmets. Uh, of the Shadana and the round shields, and we find them in the Eastern Mediterranean, but we don't find them as early as we have them on the reliefs of uh, Ramesses II. We have uh, in the Aegean the earliest uh, depiction of these round shields in uh, the end of the palace period, so this is after uh, these, these waste painters that, that Bartek has just shown us, this is a few decades before uh, the fall of the palace, and you, you can't see it here. This one has even depicted the little omphalos, the little, the little buckle. And, and these things are known from the Aegean, but again from the 11th, among the 12th century. So again, we have nothing really underdating. The, the typical Aegean shield, as everybody knows, uh, is this figure of eight shields. So the, the shields at the beginning of the 13th century have no Aegean antecedents. Nor do the horned helmets. Um, we have them uh, here in the, in the 12th century, in the developed even 12th century. What about the source? This is the last uh, item we can, we can look at. And we have quite a variety of sword types depicted uh, with the uh, Medina Harbour reliefs, um, but only a single sword type depicted in Abu Zimbel and in Abydos when we have these um, Shardana words. Um, and uh, the one sword type is quite well identifiable. It's, it's a kind of sword that is distributed along the, uh, the, the Levantine coast uh, and also uh, in, in the Hittite Empire up to the, the Sea of Marmara. Um, one, this one is an ill, it could be an ill depicted Mycenaean sword uh, type, like, like this one. But what about the earliest swords of the sea peoples? And these are like those with tapering shoulders and with uh, uh, a blade that is just tapering towards the, the tip. And the really only good parallels uh, that would be of 13th and even earlier date, 13th century or even earlier date, around this whole Mediterranean coast is, the, is from Sicily. Um, uh, I have uh, chosen some well-preserved specimens here. Uh, you can see here now the Abydos reliefs, and there's a little nice miniature 
Uh, unfortunately, the grip is, is lost now when it's in exhibition in Syracuse in the museum, but the Orsi publication, the original publication, depicts it with its pommel. Um, and so it has even this mushroom type of pommel that you can find uh, with the uh, Chardin uh, depictions. And now, in this time, that we have a single item that would fit to this type, which is the famous sword of Sicilian type on the Uluburun shipwreck. Um, now, these Sicilian uh, type swords, yeah, this is just another depiction uh, at the Ramesseum of one of these Shardana warriors. Unfortunately, in this case, the sword is just gone with the, with the damage. Now, these uh, Sicilian uh, class swords uh, have quite a possible, possible variety with different uh, grip hafting uh, devices but none of them is really as stable as the Eastern Mediterranean swords, uh, as the Hittite swords, the Levantine ones, the Mycenaean ones. It is not the sword that you would adopt because it's superior in its uh, fighting um, technical abilities. And all these types are distributed in the southern part of Italy and in Sicily, with a single exception being Uluguru. So, is there any other hint for an involvement of uh, people from this broader region in the Eastern Mediterranean. Ah, yeah, this is just to make the case uh, about the technical, um, um, the non-superiority of this, this sword. This is, it's a stabbing sword like, like the other contemporary swords in the, in the Aegean and the Levant. Um, there's a, um, one context where we have such a link, even in the time of the Urubun shipwreck, the link between uh, uh, Sicily and uh, 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 the Levant, it, it was from a rescue excavation at the Tel of Beirut, uh, when, when the, the, the city of Beirut was, was reconstructed, and it was a context which is not totally clear if it was a tomb robbed or if it was something else, a kind of a rock cut chamber it has been termed, with Mycenaean and, and Minoan imports um, of uh, 3A, 2 date, and together with this is, is this very shirt, and it's, it's a handmade vessel, uh, has a nice burnished surface, uh, it's a closed vessel, I think this is the, the, the right positioning uh, of the piece, and it has very nice parallels in, in uh, southern Italy, in, in Sicily, and um, now we, we, there was the possibility to, <coughs> to uh, examine this shirt by chemical analysis, uh, Leila Bada brought it once uh, to, to the excavation, uh, and then so I, I could sample it, and uh, Hans Mommsen made the NAA and he found that this is uh, an a chemical group which is well uh, represented around Jela. So it is really a Sicilian import to this region. So there is some connection. Um, we can also remember that the Levantine, uh, the central Levantine coast, uh, has also uh, another witness of the Chardin, which is in fact the earliest ones where, this, where the Chardin appear. Uh, in the, the letters of Rip Adda, who, who the king of Byblos, who writes to the pharaoh and about various complaints uh, uh, of the Habiru and, and other problems he has. And uh, Shardana I mentioned there uh, uh, in context, the broader context of fight. So, if there is a, a first engagement of people uh, who are, appear in warlike <coughs> context and who appear with southern Italian weapons in this time in the, in the Eastern Mediterranean, what is happening in Italy. We have to look, I think, to Italy to, to possibly understand some uh, context of this. And if there is any motive or motivation for warriors to, to, to uh, go further from, from their coasts to, towards the east. I would like to take you uh, to some uh, exemplary sites. The one is uh, Rocca Vecchia um, in Apulia. Bartek has already shown you. And this is a multi-phase site which has an impressive fortification work of the Middle Bronze Age III, uh, a wall of 20 meters thickness, which with um, uh, gates passing this wall, uh, and this, this uh, fortification was destroyed in a siege um, and burned. This is the remnants of the burned gate of oak. Um, and uh, with the inside this destruction level, we also have a few um, Aegean products, um, uh, the, the minoanizing Skufos Bartek has shown is also from this destruction level, but not from the gate. This, this Kylix is from the, date, from the gate. 
And now in the central gate, this is the this is the wooden door, and in the central gate area they have these chambers for guards, and there's one fallen warrior uh, who had this, this dagger with him, and he died because of stabbing uh, uh, wounds at his ribs. Um, this is the one victim, and then we have a group of victims in another uh, uh, of these gates. This is a smaller gate with a group of two adults. Um, two uh, juvenile uh, uh, persons and three children who had uh, hidden themselves behind a wall uh, that which with they closed these, these, um, uh, the, the, the entrance to the gate. This is, this is the outside and this is the inside of the settlement. And they, they, uh, they put up their belongings here to survive in the siege. With, uh, uh, they have herds, herds they have um, storage vessels and consumption vessels. But unfortunately, they were apparently suffocated. This is the anthropologist's uh, explanation of this, this state. Uh, that one, one has even the hand here, this one has the hand at the, at the throat. So they seem, they seem to have suffocated from the burning, from the fire of this destruction. Um, this destruction was not uh, a singular case. It, uh, there is a, a series of destructions. The problem is that not all these sites are finally published in Apulia. We are not in a, in a, in a phase to exactly date the, the, the different destruction in Apulia. Um, uh, nevertheless, it is, it is um, a phenomenon in the Middle Bronze Age uh, that we have uh, uh, um, uh, a massive uh, um, different events of, of destruction all over southern Italy and it is connected with the spread of a new weapon technology and the spread of uh, new um, elements of material culture. Uh, the second case I want to, to show you here is um, the Aeolian Islands. Um, uh, at uh, Lipari you have uh, uh, this, this village excavated to a large extent um, by Dana Bobrea on, on this cape. And this is um, a local Middle Bronze Age culture which has um, quite amazing contacts for this time in Italy to Aegean. This, this is the one exception I was talking about, the Cypriot Pithos. <coughs> They have, um, this, is another, this is another settlement, it's one of the Aeolian Islands, Salina. Uh, they have in one of the huts uh, a carnelian bead uh, necklace, which would be in Aegean um, tomb hierarchy, would, quite, would be a quite good amount of carnelian, not very often to be found. So there was some kind of uh, exchange going on at this time. And you have imported Aegean pottery. It's all imported at that stage, with, with one or two exceptions, with all, which are already locally made. And this is late Hellenic 3A1 material. Now, uh, all these settlements are destroyed in uh, burning uh, these four settlements. And this was one of the, the motives for Berna Bobrea to, to, to talk about historical scenario because none of these settlements is re-established except for Lipari um, and the re-establishment is accompanied by a very deep change of material culture both in terms of everyday uh, um, um, uh, material culture, pottery of all classes and of bronze uh, items too um, and after this also these international contexts that were uh, previously um, uh, visible in the material culture, they diminish to a very considerable extent. So uh, from, from a point of reference and of contact to the Eastern Mediterranean, this is shrinking uh, and it becomes a much more insignificant point. The international contexts <coughs> sw switch to the south, to uh, Sicily, to southeastern Sicily, uh, where we have an, a limited amount of Aegean imports in the tombs of especially Tapsos and a, a, a number of sites around Syracuse and uh, this is one of these Tapsos swords that I have shown you before but the basic um, material culture is local except for the settlement of Tapsos which has in, in, impressive Aegeanizing features but I don't want to discuss this, this in detail I want to come back rather to, to a possible a uh, push factor for populations in southern um, Italy. I come back to this kind of uh, rapid culture change that we observe. To be sure, we have not many settlement excavations where we can already grab this. Um, we can see this in Nipari, as I have shown you, which is the, the, the one settlement resettled after the destruction. We have a distinctive new 
uh, uh, kind of, of pottery and new kind of bronzes, which are to be related to two regions in northeastern Italy. The best typological parallels are for, the, for this pottery are from this region and not from the intermediate regions in, in central Italy. Uh, the same is good for the, for the bronzes. This is the Middle Bronze Age swords that, that you have already seen before, which is before the destruction, and after the destruction you, you get bronze types of North Italian uh, origin. And this is a phenomenon that happens all over Italy, but this, this destruction context is a very specific thing of uh, at least the Aeolian Islands and maybe of Apulia, but here we are lacking still good uh, excavation and data. The new bronze weapons uh, that are introduced are um, these um, cut and thrust swords. You, you probably know them from the debate. They, so they replace the earlier Sicilian uh, stabbing swords, not only in the eastern Mediterranean, where you may know this uh, uh, type from, but even in southern Italy. And uh, uh, together with these uh, weapons go also um, elements of dress that are also of northern Italian uh, origin and become uh, usual in the south. And this is the spread of these new weapons beyond Italy. You see them um, in the Aegean since the 13th century. They spread to Cyprus and even with one example uh, to Ugarit. And in the Aegean, among the earliest pieces are um, of Italian weapons are these kinds here from Mycenae. Fortunately, they are all from um, quite well dated contexts. And um, now we can uh, think about uh, a historical analogy, I would uh, suggest, that um, is also not, um, not new, but this, but this very assemblage, I think, is, is quite good um, evidence for that, that we have a similar thing here, uh, uh, as the, such as the practice of Ramesses II, when you have warriors with a uh, um, um, more developed weapon threatening you, like, like Bartek has uh, summarized before, it is one natural response, once you have beaten them, to integrate them to your uh, military, as Ramesses II did, and make them also produce their weapons. This, in fact, was never really favored in, in Greece, the, the lappen by the, the, the winged eggs, um, but there is at least one of these molds in a very um, uh, clear palatial context. And this here are ivory um, um, fittings for the, for the handle of such a Nauru sword, and it's in fact the only ivory uh, fitting that is, that is existing. So this, this proves in Italy they don't do it, in Greece they don't do it. Uh, it's the only thing, and, and the, the fact that it's like the other objects from the citadel proves the social context of these warriors. So I think it would be quite an imaginable scenario that they were also kind of a palace guard. You can also think of other historical analogies. For, for example, for instance, the, the, the Muslims uh, in the guard of Federico II or the Baregians uh, for the Byzantine uh, emperors, which would be loyal because they are isolated from the rest of the population and being part of a uh, of a foreign group and um, Federico II even put them in a single in a single Apulian city separated. Here, this this dagger is even off from the part of the eastern wing of the palace itself. Now, uh, if you do analysis of, of these early um, Italian type weapons in Greece, you find, and I make it very short, that um, uh, the dagger I've shown you and the sword short sword are made of um, copper that uh, is um, of uh, North Italian origin. And uh, we made an um, analytical project with Matthias Mierhofer and Ernst Pernitzka uh, on, on this phenomenon of Urnfield weapons spreading to the Eastern Mediterranean. And we found that this group of Italian uh, copper here, is, uh, this copper is not found in Aegean type weapons. It is confined to uh, Italian type weapons. And uh, this is the, the copper, uh, uh, the region of the elite isotopes of, of the copper of Cyprus, and here we find both Mycenaean type and Italian type weapons. So we have both local manufacture, but the earliest ones, uh, or two at least of the earliest ones, are real imports from Italy. So that it was not the raw material imported, but the weapons themselves, because otherwise we would expect to have also Mycenaean weapons made with this copper, which is not the case. Um, and now we come back to Termitido. Um, this is uh, uh, this dagger type, which is uh, which I've shown you uh, before in my city, and one of these daggers was also found in Termitido. And we come back to this issue of this pottery. Um, so um, 
This is this, um, this vessel that, that Bartek has shown you on the book cover, uh, which is in fact a deviation of all Aegean shapes. It's not even a Minoan shape. It's an, a mixture of basically an Italian shape, because the Italian handmade pottery has this uh, vasi a collo, as the Italians say, it's basically an amphora. Um, but it is painted with my, uh, Mycenaean motifs, and we have already heard about the special connection to the archive workshops. And this is workshops which were the workshops working for the export to the Levant and to Cyprus. And this pottery is really the palace, um, the palace workshops. And uh, uh, we can link um, uh, these Tamitito uh, shirts to, to that work. Now, um, okay, of course it is possible that we have a pirate incursion and that some of these, these potters is captured, but there is a little of a topographical problem because these are the workshops of Mycenae, which are quite inland. And this is not the workshops at Tectilians, which are coastal workshops. So I still would think it is rather somebody who has come as an Italian. We have seen that there is some evidence for Italians, in, 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 in uh, quotation marks, in Mycenae. So it's possible that was also somebody working in these workshops and got this knowledge. Yeah, I need some more colors for that. And this is the distribution of the works of this, this workshop. Um, now, the palaces fell at the end of the 13th century in Greece, and uh, it was a very selective event, this burning, um, the burning specifically of the palaces, um, and uh, not of uh, the lower citadel here at uh, Tyrans, so I think it's, um, it is not an earthquake, uh, this destruction, even if there was some, some storeroom which had uh, oil inside that could spill and eventually burn, uh, a real earthquake destruction usually does not um, um, uh, go along with, uh, with this uh, burning event when you have mud bricks houses. So I think this is, this is an, a purpose, purposely burning the palaces, and this, all the palaces are basically burned, but here you can clearly see that, that where there is not a non-highest level, social level of population, there is no, no such burning. And interesting is also that the gates are burned, so I think this is an internal conflict. This is uh, a kind of a revolution which brings down this palace uh, power, and uh, we see in, uh, evidence for internal warfare also even depicted in the palaces itself. This is a fresco in Pyrrhus, which is usually interpreted as reflecting early phase of the, of the Pyrrhus uh, uh, the, um, kingdom, and because of the fact that these people are wearing not the usually uh, uh, woven clothes, uh, say it's like in like a kind of mythical, mythical past, but why not thinking of populations of the mountains? of some kind uh, like the Khabiru in the uh, Near East. Why are they not possibly also populations of, of the Peloponnese? And in fact, there is no real um, iconography for uh, foreigners in, in Mycenaean art. So possibly this is also an internal conflict, which would be another kind of motivation of, of fleeing. Like, like the Khabiru did, I remind you of the uh, 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 story of Atsiru and the foundation of the Kingdom of Amur. Now, um, at this point, at the end of the palace period, we have uh, an intensification of the, of the um, relationship between the central Mediterranean and Mycenaean Greece, and this is not surprising because now the, the state has disintegrated in Greece and the social uh, groups are much more compatible to, to each other, so to speak. We have to imagine small-scale population, um, uh, 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 social units like chiefdoms in Greece, so they could communicate more on an equal footing um, uh, with uh, the Mycenaeans uh, and vice versa. And one of these um, sites in southern Italy, which dates to this uh, time period around 1200, I have been excavating together with Marco Pacciarelli of the University of Naples, and we found um, a harbor uh, a site, a natural harbor protected by um, uh, this reef, uh, which was then uh, three meter, is now three meter below surface uh, the sea level, but it was, was a bay like this, which explains this favorable uh, place. And we found, as Bartik has already mentioned, a lot of imported my, uh, Mycenaean and Minoan pottery, which is all, but a small quantity of the overall site uh, uh, material. And um, uh, there is one can now ask why such a small site, and a small, it's what 1.2 hectare in a, in a small region, was able to attract so many imports. Um, they probably they could not have an economic capacity uh, to be really interesting for for uh, a, a bigger Aegean community. 
And it, they are, this is an exception in southern Italy, as Bartok has already said. Now, there is some other evidence which is very, very unusual uh, in this site. It's just um, an ivory figurine um, of my known origin. It's, it's like this small. It, it looks like big now, but it's uh, like five centimeters high. And this is a kind of object which is never exported from the EG. This is an, a religious object which is, has a, a specific iconography, has its sense in a religious system in the Aegean, and would be totally um, out of context in Italy because basically the Italian, uh, uh, different Italian cultures don't produce iconography apart from these uh, horned handles that are symbolizing uh, bulls, perhaps. But there is, they are unicoined for the rest. It's like Islam, it's an unicoined religion. Um, uh, and so, uh, this is not something that would be easily integrated. But it could be a war booty. Let's like, think of Lindisfarne, uh, the Vikings plundering um, uh, uh, a monastery. And at that very time, we have uh, uh, the wider spread of Italian type pottery to uh, uh, the Aegean and to the Near East. And this is uh, very, very different kinds of context with very different quantities. I just want uh, to highlight that the chronological peak is after the fall of the palaces, when there is an increased movement between these areas, peaceful and non-peaceful. And uh, when we find this all over the place, sometimes combined this kind of pottery with the new type of weapon and with traditional types of razor that are totally different from the EGM razor. So I think there is kind of movement going on with warriors uh, involved coming from the central Mediterranean. Now, if we go back to the Levant for five more minutes, if I have, um, we can see the effects of this breaking down of the system of the palaces in Greece. We are just after 1200 now in the northern Levant uh, at two sites. Uh, the one was, was uh, directed by our host, Joachim Brechtschneider, together with uh, Van Leerberge from, from here, from uh, uh, Belgium. Uh, and uh, in the last season, before the outbreak of the war, uh, it was possible to investigate the first early Iron Age layers and the latest late Bronze Age layers in a, in a larger extent than before. And here we have uh, a destruction level with uh, Mycenaean imports, which are however old at that time, and uh, uh, different local pottery types. But together with this uh, import, we have the first local products in this destruction layer, which reflect the chronology uh, of the very first post-palatial phase in Greece. And this continues in the next layer, but now a new group, both typologically and um, in terms of fabric, appears. So we have two different kinds of adoption, uh, adoption of, of EG and pottery types, one that is continuing from the first um, level and one that is uh, newly made. Uh, chemical analysis have proven that these are also distinct chemical uh, groups. So, and these, these vessels have no predecessors in the, in the levels before. It's, it, it's a um, sim, um, similar phenomenon to Palestine. The, the types of the, of the Philistine monochrome pottery, as this is called, uh, are not locally produced types that were fir first imported. So it's not a, it's not a substitution of, of trade, it's something new. But unlike Palestine, this is a very small quantity. We have very, the, the extent of this excavation is not uh, large, so I don't do a quantification, but it's securely less than 10%. So if we have newcomers, it's a small group among the population. Now the second site is further south, at the, at the border between Syria and, and, and Lebanon. It is beside, precisely in Amuru, where we were uh, talking uh, uh, about before. And um, I, I would join this, this, this um, uh, deep debate now. So here we have a destruction at the end of the late Bronze Age. Um, uh, it is a multi-layered site and the destruction is a fiery destruction here at that level. You can even see it from the different color of the, of the rocks, of the uh, boulders. And in this destruction level, like in Teltwani, we have already the first um, locally made Mycenaean pottery. Again, like in Teltwani, it's a small quantity. Uh, in very special contexts, like up to 10%, but usually it's much less than 10%. And interestingly, it's not only painted Mycenaean pottery that you usually find in the local production in Cyprus and the Levante, but it's one third is unpainted, fineware, not cooking pots. These cooking pots are very rare, but usually it's, it's fineware. 
And this is a local phenomenon without good parallel, so far as I know. I mean, maybe Asaf is uh, correcting me if he has new statistical data from somewhere. It's, it's unique, you know? it's this, and, but it is already present in the, in the destruction and it continues in the next level, uh, nearly without big uh, typological changes. And together with this locally made Mycenaean pottery, we have locally made Italian pottery. Uh, there has been made a petrographic and chemical analysis, um, and uh, the petrography has, has assigned this to the Akar plain, to the region of Amuru. Um, and uh, uh, it is uh, clearly technologically dependent on Italian um, uh, uh, predecessors because they have rock tempered, which they don't do with the Syrian pottery, they don't do it with the local Mycenaean pottery, only this pottery has rock tempered, um, uh, Shamot and Hoops. And um, the, the type variety is really interesting because we have the typical uh, carinated cups. This is another site in the Akar plain, Tel Ara, on the Lebanese side of the plain. And here you see uh, uh, one of these things that we excavated in, in uh, Pundari Zambrone, but you can find them all over southern Italy. Um, you have mainly these whole mouth jars, this is the big majority, so there's a little bit of a difference to Italy, because in Italy you do have more tableware, more of these carinated cups, here you have more of these jars. But then you have also like trays, with, I, I always show you the parallel from Italy to the right. And you have these kind of amphora that, that were probably the, the, the inspiration for this Mycenaeanizing piece from Termitito. This is the, this is the Italian prototype handmade. So there, there must have been a population group that was used to do this kind of pottery before the destruction of, uh, of, of uh, Amuru. And if the destruction of Amuru, which is the first one in the late Bronze Age, is the destruction that is referred to in the year 8 inscription, we could think about what is the relation of the destroyers with this population? I always thought the, 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 the choice to make, to set up this camp in Amuru was because these people knew already the region. Like the model, which we have uh, an immigration model, where the, the pioneers go, provide in, in information to the, to the homeland, and then more people come. So there were already people integrated there. I don't know which way, there were, the pottery is spread all over the place. It's not a quarter of Italians. It's, in different houses, um, and because the others knew, they came. But now, uh, uh, if if, um, if if we take the, 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 the story that they that they have betrayed uh, their their armies, it could be also an internal revolt that, that led to that. But but I leave this for the final di um, discussion. If there are really uh, uh, newcomers who destroy the settlements, or if this is also here an internal conflict that leads to this to this burning. In any case, it is a very rare thing. It is, it is absent in the southern Levant, this Italian pottery. We have it in Ara, um, um, a few pieces, but the excavation is very, very, very restricted at that phase. Um, we have it in Cyprus, but very, very small amount. So I don't think this goes via Cyprus. It comes from the Aegean. Um, in Cyprus, it's very rare. We have many excavations in Cyprus, large-scale excavations. Karl Jorgis was paying a lot of attention to this kind of pottery. And it's very, very few pieces that are related to Italy and Cyprus. So we have a direct relationship to the Aegean and to Italy probably via the Aegean because think of the local Mycenaean pottery that comes together with the local Italian. Um, and this is one of the contexts where we have a little bit more of this Italian pottery. Uh, yeah, I have talked about the model and I think my time is over. Uh, so I don't go into the debate of the, of the Sea People's ships, which I don't think are Aegean ships. But again, have to do with uh, these part of them have to do with Italian uh, uh, prototypes. So I think um, I will just close this this um, uh, I hope not too chaotic uh, presentation with reminding you that we have now various scenarios possible why people could move from the central Mediterranean to the Aegean and from the Aegean further east. We can have uh, a push factor if we have internal warfare in southern Italy, possibly caused by war by warriors spreading this new uh, weapon technology from the north. Uh, we have the possibility of this instable Aegean relationships that they had. They do not get constant Mycenaean imports. They do not have this high level interrelationships. So when, they, when their social structure in terms of chieftains depends on having these goodies to be distributed about uh, the followers of the chief and this thing breaks down, there can be a problem for the up for holding up this social structure. So this might be another motive to go and get the things that you can't get regularly anymore. 
to go to piracy because otherwise uh, you cannot maintain uh, the social structure that you have. We know this from the migration. Uh, uh, goods and money, they, 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 they go over uh, the Roman frontier. But you also have the possibility that this evolves in a certain kind of, of resistance uh, and a, a mobilization against this war. Uh, so that the, the, the victims of uh, war became, become active. And uh, uh, we can see this uh, also uh, nowadays. I don't want to make an ethno-archaeological case, I just want to say that it can be a, a step, a short step from being a victim to, to become uh, a, a liberator, to become a self-defender and to change things as they were. But I want uh, to close with a more um, um, positive uh, image. Thank you.